Warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. And we'll go back to Hazardous Materials, last week's comics this week, wherein we talk about last week's comics this week. And then throw in some multimedia news at the very end just to keep you interested for that full hour. And hungry, hungry for those clicks. My name is Casey Johnson with me. Gabe Gonzalez. So uh, I hate to <laughs> always start the show on, an, on a low note, but I just want to build up to good things, you know? Yeah, we want to get the, I, I feel like it's like we want to pull the, the masking tape off as quickly as possible. I'm just, I'm so sick of... DC's current direction, which is personified in Hell Arisen number three by James Tynan and Steve Epting, which really shocked me because I expected a lot better art from Steve Epting. About DC's direction, I guess AT&T had the same feeling. Oh, God. I don't we'll want, get into don't that. want to talk about those dumb rumors. <laughs> Basically, the big reason we're talking about this is because Punchline's full appearance is in this, but this one might be even more cameo than her first appearance because... Once again, just like three panels where she doesn't say anything. There is no fanfare. There's nothing saying, hey, cool, look at this new character we've got. It's a non-appearance. I think there's like one panel of Joker talking about Punchline. He references her, and then she stands there, and you get a frame of her saying nothing. Yep. And that's about it on old Punchline. But, yeah. Um, you know, if it really wasn't for Punchline and everything, I don't think we'd even be talking about this. No. it's Because this, this issue sucked yeah it's this mini series is just desperate to wrap up all the big dumb stuff from scott snyder's justice league run which i have spoken to death about how much i didn't enjoy it and it's just wrapping up all this year of the villain crap so i mean we know how it's gonna end the batman who laughs is gonna get locked away in a box until they need to goose sales again lex luther is gonna become a human again and no longer be this stupid white martian thing And uh, villains will probably return to their regular status quo. At the very least, Booster Gold, who laughs, ain't going to stick around. Oh, my God. You know, I've said this before. I enjoy villain books. Villain books are usually smartly written Mm -hmm. or humorously written, and they're great fun. Um, Even DC's villain books, which, of course, one of them is my all-time favorite, Sinister Six. Six. Secret Six. How can – thank you. How can you screw this up and make me hate this book? I don't – okay, I don't hate hate it. But this thing made me want to fall asleep. It's very boring. It's so boring. Like, I'm I'm so sick of the Batman Who Laughs. I'm so sick of Apex Lex. I'm sick of Lex. Like, I, Lex Luthor is one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. Mm-hmm. And he has been completely unreadable for the past, what, three years since Snyder took over Justice League? I'm, I'm just sick of it. It's, so we can blame Snyder for pretty much everything. Yeah, it's Scott Snyder's really driving the ship on this. This is written by James Tynan, but it's Tynan wrapping up Snyder's plots. It, it was Snyder also responsible for the new Lantern Corps that was introduced a while back? The uh, inf- Ultra, Ultra Ultraviolet? Violet? Yeah, that was a, a Snyder Okay, joint. as much as I love me some Lantern Corps, and I do, and I actually did get a, a Lantern Corps ring for mm-hmm. this, strictly out of complete, complete completionist, I still thought it was absurd. Yeah. It's and uh, the whole uh, speed force and slow force are th- not. Oh, that's his doing too. Yeah, that I believe so. I, I think because I think that first showed up in his Justice League run, and then Williamson ran with it with like the Sage Force and the Slow Force and the oh god, the Strength Force. So we can pretty much point to pretty much everything that's dull and boring about DC. Yes, at either Snyder or. By virtue of rumor alone. <laughs> Dan DiDio. Yes. And one of them's out the door already, so I need someone new and, to blame. And man. Oh, I wish we could talk. I, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I hate constantly cutting promos on Snyder books, but at su- a certain point, he just confused big with good. Yeah. Because, like, I love Court of Owls. I love Black Mirror. I love Zero Year. But... I just, just felt like post zero year, he's had this constant need to up the stakes for every Batman story. And then we get just like incomprehensible garbage like metal, which I do not understand why metal is a popular comic. It's bad. I don't know either. And apparently the person that wrote metal uh, was very defensive about it to the point where he didn't want it included in other books. Somehow. Scott Snyder. Uh, is, uh, yeah. Okay. Snyder. So, I mean, I was, I was reading something, of course, granted, take this with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I, I understand they purposely excised this 
out of uh, the world building series that they were uh, doing at that same time. Remember we were, how we were confused? We were just like, how is this yeah. happening at the same time? This is working. I mean, Snyder's like basically kind of running the show right now in terms of like DC creative. So it, everything is bending around it. Like we, how we had how every book tied into Year of the Villain, regardless of it made sense in the timeline, because some books took place in flashbacks and still had this stupid Legion of Doom sign in the sky. So yeah. who knows? How much time do you think Snyder's got? Honestly, his books sell really damn well. So do they? as long as he damn well pleases. Damn it. Moving on, though, to an actually good comic book. Yeah, Batman <laughs> Superman number seven. This, So I, I jumped on this book because, A, no more Batman who laughs garbage, like in the first six issues. But also, B, Nick Darrington, who's one of my favorite artists the last couple of years, took over art duties for this and the next issue. And my God, it's just so much joy in every panel. This is some old school stuff. Yes, it is a very classic feeling Batman and Superman adventure. It was so old school. I mean, it, uh, the uh, the statue they used for Jor-El, it felt like old 70s Jor-El with the headband and the sun's logo yeah, on his chest. It's it's great. So this book is building off of how the Battle City of Kandor was destroyed in Bendis' Man of Steel miniseries. Mm-hmm. And General Zod is not taking well to this. Because, you know, General Zod has got some serious uh, control issues. Oh, yeah. So he uh, goes by the destroyed Fortress of Solitude, scoops up the Bottle City, and goes flying off. To bad places. Yes. Meanwhile, uh, Ra's al Ghul, Batman, and Superman have a little tangle, and Ra's al Ghul is like, yo, General Zod beat me up to get the locations of Lazarus Pits, but I didn't tell him. So well, let's they're... not completely <laughs> gloss over that Ra's al Ghul had a kryptonite sword. Yeah, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Which he forged from the corpse of the kryptonite man. Yeah. So good. It was synthetic stuff, but still it burns. Yeah, it was. That was it was cool. awesome. And so, yeah, General Zod plans to bathe the tiny bodies of the people of Kandor in a Lazarus pit to bring back the Kryptonians. And uh, spoiler alert, he totally does. Yes. And a long list of bad ideas. It's really up there. Yeah. The, uh, the la- little last page hook is... A bunch of heat vision on tiny Kryptonians flying at the heroes. Now, for those of you that may not know completely what the hell we're talking about, because we are kind of cross pollinating when we're talking about Batman, Superman stuff. Um, when you go into a Lazarus pit, you don't come out intact. You will come out kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. So imagine like tons of insane flying Kryptonians. Yeah. Also, like for those those who don't know at home, the Bottle City of Candor is uh, was the capital city of Krypton and when Brainiac blew up Krypton he shrunk down their capital city in a jar yeah and Superman's always kept it in his fortress and that's where Supergirl's family was Mm -hmm. yeah I don't think she actually is she from Kandor uh she was not on Kandor when it blew up because she got rocketed out right so fun fact Supergirl's older than Superman yes she she was a teenager when she was rocketed away and thanks to timey-wimey space stuff Mm -hmm. she stayed a teenager the entire time science so yeah this is definitely some old school i noticed that everybody was wearing their 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 tidy whities there's a really fun montage (laughs) of just like superman and batman cracking cases with like dr bizarro twin titanos uh clock king with his clockwork robots yeah and they're all talking about the fact that they did this to distract themselves from their past yes because they had a Pretty heavy week with uh, the Batman who laughs. But thankfully, he's disguised to other books now, so I can enjoy Batman and Superman. <laughs> Definitely give it a read. Uh, if you love great, fun, kinetic art, Nick Darrington is a tough guy to beat. He's worked on Batman Universe with Bendis, and he's worked on Doom Patrol. Excellent, excellent stuff. Do you remember when this title was actually called Superman Batman? I do. Well, and they noticed they kind of flipped it around when they finally realized... Okay, our money is definitely with this brooding dude. Gotta gotta push those back. Because even New 52 was Batman, Superman. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a I'm a world's finest stand myself. I do, in fact, great love title. some world's finest. Because that reminds me of the childhood. And it's just vague enough that you can have it be an anthology book with other stuff in it. Yeah, because world's finest, uh, at, the, at a time when uh, comics, God, I'm going to show my age on this one, were 35 cents, 45 cents, 50 cents. World's Finest was a dollar. Yeah, but it, it was, was filled a with stuff. Big old square bound. A little 64 page monstrosity. <laughs> Love me some World's Good Finest. Stuff. Uh, and you know, like 
I, it's a big reason why I always hate going on those rants about the bad big DC books, because there's so many DC books that I adore right now. Mm-hmm. Another one of those is Suicide Squad by Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo. I did not expect Suicide Squad to be keeping its consistency it's like so this. so fun. Oh, they just ramp it up. In this issue, we finally get what like the hook of the series is going to be. Oh. It's uh, so they bring in Deadshot into the fold after last issue where they intentionally screwed the pooch on the mission. Mm hmm. And uh, Deadshot's in now with the revolutionaries, and they reveal that the Suicide Task Force X has had a takeover from within. Like, they've already met Locke, the new boss. Right. But he's not working for the U.S. government. Oh? He's working for someone else. So this is what happens when I don't have enough time to read it. It's, oh, <laughs> it's good. It's a good mystery. And Locke, also in the fun th- last page reveal, has a little Suicide Squad shock implant himself really who's that oh he, we don't know yet his, his mysterious shadowy figure after he fails after the squad fails on their mission he gives him a shock oh wait it was definitely a week for mysterious bosses i was i was reading another comic um god i'm trying to remember what the comic i was actually reading at the time um but there was a guy in the background and then he was talking it was like i don't like the fact he's talking he sends one of his thugs and the thug gets completely beaten up does that ring any bells with you uh, not on the top of my head. I must have been reading one of the books you weren't. I uh, I really wish I could remember which one it was. <laughs> one of my favorite things about... So there, there's a bunch of highlights I want to get through on this issue because I loved it. It was my favorite issue this week. And it was a competitive-ass field with Grim Noir and Giant Size X-Men. And X-Men. Yeah, and Vanilla X-Men as well. Oh, Vanilla X-Men. So much to do. <laughs> but uh, in Squad, so we get a little bit more on a six who controls has a dial that switches to different deadly sins to affect people with. Yeah. And Harley asks him about, it and he says, the dial allows me to target my foe with one of six deadly sins. And she goes, but aren't there seven? Well, yes, but weaponizing lust would be icky. <laughs> <laughs> that one made me laugh. And you knew immediately what I was laughing at when I was reading it too. The character who, uh, was my favorite when they first reveal a character designs jog, who is the, out, the out of shape speedster who has to recharge constantly. Yeah. He, you finally see him in action. It's a great sequence. It's just filled with panels of him taking dudes out after he has six, put them to sleep first. Cause oh. he's, <laughs> he's, it's a great, but it's like, Hey, can you make this a little easier on me, man? He's like, fine. Sloth. And affects well, that, all these guards with sloth. So, oh, so that's what his name is, is six. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense now. And, uh, Jog, it's a great little sequence. We're going to show it right there because it's just a nice, solid page of action. Now, I guess we're going for one quality book to what you're telling me is one of the best quality books you've seen this week. And that's Fantastic Four Grim Noir. Yes. Oh, my God. Tell me about that because I didn't get a chance to crack it. So it's a a grim detective story. Who knew? It's a solo issue focusing on my boy Benjamin J. Grimm, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing, mm-hmm. and Petunia's favorite nephew, the idol of millions. It's got a nice black and white cover, too. Yes. I like that. Yeah. It's uh, drawn by Ron Garney with Jerry Dugan on writing duties, who we love from Marauders. And this is the second Fantastic Four one-shot he's done. He also did four Yancey Street a few months back. And that I was, remember that. That was a ton of fun. Uh, this one... Uh, Ben's wife, Alicia, comments that they're not quite neighbor, but the woman in the apartment across the street from them usually sings and she can't hear her sing anymore. Mm. So Benny boy goes to puts on his old hat and duster to go investigate. Ah, it's so incognito. And she disappeared. Mm. And Ben wonders if it's tied to the mysterious nightmares he's been having in which he is. uh, (laughs) He has to holler, but he ain't got no mouth. Ah, uh, yes, the Harlan Ellison reference you were talking about earlier. Yep, yep. I, I got a great laugh out of that. It's my favorite line. And it turns out it's the machinations of Doctor Strange classic foe. Not nightmare, despair. Oh, God, despair. <laughs> you may remember him from uh, Uncanny X-Men when Scott Summers was very sad after Dark Phoenix Saga. Yes, I haven't heard about despair in decades. So, yeah, Benny Boy, who uh, has, does the classic trope of Living through the nightmare of his life. Really good touching stuff there. Does Despair classified as a demon in Marvel Universe, or is he just next dimensional like Nightmare is? Uh, who's to say? Oh, I, I just want to classify him. I, I want to classify him. I don't know my, my <laughs> Marvel magic hierarchies too, too well. I used, I, I used to keep track on that weird stuff. Marvel Universe really made that easier for me. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> it's like, I know all this knowledge. I don't have to read the books I hate. So, obviously, Benny Boy solves the case. Saves the gal. 
they all become friends. So from that description, you're telling me this is a one shot. Yes, it okay. is a it is a self contained one shot. It is very 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 good. I highly recommend picking it up. And just oh, I'm I'm praying that Jerry Dugan gets a, a thing solo, it's particularly if Ron Garney joins him because. I've loved Garney's art since he was on Hulk when I was a kid. And so him drawing big old monsters, is a perfect fit for me. I, Ron Garney seems to ring a bell with me on some of the stuff that I would read. So. He did. A, he was drawing Daredevil a couple years back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to say he had a stint on Wolverine. That's probably where I saw yeah. him. He's a great artist. Highly recommend. So now we're going to go into the first of the giant sized X-Men that are going to be releasing this year. <laughs> and you picked up on this one that this is an homage issue. Yes. To uh, New X-Men number 121, which is one of my favorite X-Men issues of all time. I went and cracked that, and I was looking at all the references for it. I was like, damn. Yeah, it is. Pre- they, Even down to the board, uh, Wolverine's uh, sitting at the door. It uh, does not have a baby <laughs> fight, though. No, it does not have a baby <laughs> fight. There are no choking. Um, so X-Men 121 is when um, Emma Frost and Jean Grey discover that Charles Xavier tried to kill his twin in utero. Yes. Which is Cassandra Nova. Who then becomes probably one of the nastiest X-Men villains ever made. My personal favorite X-Men villain. She is the person that mechanated the uh, slaughter of Genosha. Yep. Which killed 8 million mutants. A whole lot of mutants. A lot of mutants. And they killed him in two pages. Yeah. It was like the counter for 8 million was just going down and down and down as their sentinels were just completely barbecuing this little island. Eat for extinction is an all-timer. That was that was hardcore, but uh, it made me really hate her. And I guess that's that's the goal. One of the uh, the big creative feats of Morrison and Quitely's X Men issue one twenty one is it's a silent issue because it's part of the Nuff said initiative they did, where all the books Marvel published that month were completely silent, except Pulling for the Snake Eyes. Yeah, except for like one line at the very end. Uh, Gene has a line about uh, Charles Xavier tried to kill his sister in utero. We need, we to, need talk. to talk, which they echo in this. <laughs> Also one of the like only lines of dialogue in it. And here Storm crash lands on Krakoa unconscious. So Jean and Emma got to go in and poke around in her brain. There's a fun little bit where uh, a couple of big old spirit cats that represent some part of her subconscious are mm-hmm. like kind of guarding her mind. And Jean shows her that scene where she and Storm embrace during Inferno. And they're like, okay, you're cool. And then... <laughs> Emma has a show of that scene of them fighting. Yeah, when they swap bodies. <laughs> yeah, which wasn't cool. <laughs> yeah, so so they get into a big fight, and Gene, of course, blah, blows mm-hmm. them all up. And then r- from the shattered t- uh, cats builds an elephant with butterfly wings. Which I thought was, yeah, that was, that was pretty Very fun. Yeah, Russell Dodderman draws this, and he is one of my favorite current working artists. Uh, he's hot off of doing most of the Jane Foster Thor run. And I, he's talked about wanting to do X Men for years. He did the uh, Greg Rucka Cyclops solo book during the Young X Men stuff, and so seeing him just draw, go all on these gorgeous mindscapes, and they, it were, is, they were gorgeous and simple. Yeah, I really like that. It's incredibly easy to follow, which is very important when you're doing I've a always, dialogue. I've always really comic. enjoyed uh, when someone can take um, simple concepts and comics and turn them into mm-hmm. beauty. There's an an amazing sequence of Gene and Emma getting like crushed by negative space mm-hmm. there's just a lot of weird creepy oh a very creepy body horror bit when they uh reveal why storm's unconscious yeah they, they pull off what seems to be her scalp and there's a countdown on it and then that's when they came out and says uh yeah storm's got what two hours to live she's been we, like affected by like a techno organic virus kind of deal we ought to talk yeah and of course that was the end of the book um that uh, apparently, these giant size X Men are what the annuals have now become. So we're gonna get this. We're gonna get one for Magneto. Uh, we're gonna get one for Wolverine Night- and uh, not, not for Wolverine. No, Nightcrawler. Yeah, Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler. Uh, Phantom X, and oh, there's one more that I can't remember. And Phantomix, I think, is gonna be really important because that's the body that we last left Xavier. Yeah. In. So what's he been up to? Yeah. What's that guy all about? <laughs> there, uh, there's so many plot lines that. Are, are just hitting my head because I mean, if you're a mutant and you're in Marvel, odds are you're alive now. So mm-hmm. I was thinking about uh, the um, the old the second New Mutants run, which had uh, the bus explosion that killed all those mutants, like Tag and Wallflower yeah. and all those. Like, what's going on with them? I would really like to see that whole thing come back because <laughs> Icarus is clearly alive, as we can see as yeah. an X Men that we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, 
everybody it seems to be like, I think was it Melody Melody was not killed I actually know we probably shouldn't get into that we're yeah, getting out of ourselves she is the on main one. focus of the main X-Men book which we're about to talk about as a matter of fact I think let's just dive straight into that one. Oh yeah I love this damn book man oh boy it was so much to talk about um, I mean the, the whole thing is what do you do with all of the depowered mutants from House of M mm-hmm. um, I mean you can't just line them up and basically tell them, hey, guess what? We're going to have to kill you because that's the only way you're getting your powers back. That seems like a morbid way of going yeah. about things. I had always assumed that at the end of AVX when uh, blank, when Hope, I I thought that one of the things she did was reignite all the people who'd lost their powers. But I'm, I guess I was wrong on that point. No, I, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of that. false starts on that particular thing, but yeah. I even thought that Axis was going like, to bring it all back. Because, like, Beak turned back into a bird boy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think he actually had a specific storyline that happened to him that caused okay. that. Um, or, you know what? Um, damn, you know what? I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Please let us know, viewers. Yeah, if you know got how it. Beak got his ugly face back again, because it did pop up in New Mutants and their B story. Yeah. how that happen? I mean, did it automatically happen? I... I really think Hope reignited at least some of them, but then some people just didn't. Yeah, because Angel also had her wings. Yeah, exactly. But Prodigy lost his powers and didn't get them back. Yeah, I noticed that too. And that's and we find out this issue how he's getting them back. Yeah. Uh, well, the neat thing about Prodigy is the fact that he was able to retain all the information he had already collected. Yeah. So even Deep Howard, he's an asset, and that's the reason why he stayed in the in the Young, book that he yeah. was in. Um. So, um. This got deep. This got deep very quickly um, because it appears that they're trying to come up with a a way that people can get their powers, but take ownership for how they're getting them. So that isn't just a big process line of here. I'm going to stab you in the head. OK, now you're back. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to be a trial by fire. You know, you're going to earn your place in mutant society. You know, what are you bringing to the table? And so the focus of this particular story is, of course, one of the Guthrie children, mm-hmm. because the Guthrie children. Being Sam, uh, Husk, yeah, uh, Husk, Melody, Arrow, Icarus. There's a lot of mutants in this, so much so that even Apocalypse says, Ah, Guthrie, a fine, a strong mutant name, a strong family, indeed. (laughs) Because all of Sam's uh, brothers and sisters, and he's got a lot of them. I do think it's, I do think it's funny that they bring Arrow back. When she had been gone for years, and in the interim, they made another character named Arrow. <laughs> yeah. What I always thought was kind of strange, and I don't, I don't know if it's strange or maybe it's just a culture shift, is when they when they bring back mutants, they pretty much bring them back butt naked and show them to everybody. And it's like, that's awfully humbling. Eggs out. Because that's what they did to the uh, team that went to handle mm-hmm. the Sentinels. Yep. It's like, hey, look, we brought them back. They're butt naked. Here's all 50 million people. Here. And the, and they did that to Melody. Yeah, poor gal. Um, Mortifying. So here's the thing. Um, they Wolverine does not dig on this. Wolverine doesn't dig on this whole shindig, but he purposely says, you know what? I don't like it, but I'm not running a show. And fun, funny slim, neither are you. You're not in the council, <laughs> but it's happening. And that's just the way it is. And if you want to talk phil- ph- uh, the, ph- the philosophy of it, maybe you should talk to the guy who's always got religion on his mind, which is Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. So we have to Nightcrawler and Nightcrawler is it turns out this is his idea. This this mm-hmm. whole concept the crucible of the crucible is his idea. And I, I was really shocked by that. I was really shocked about how willing he was to to create a new mutant religion. Unfortunately, a part of Nightcrawler's ritual did not include having the contestant cut a promo with Mean Gene to call out Apocalypse <laughs> first. Yeah, so apparently they threw you into an arena with Apocalypse. He's got a sword. Yeah, you got a sword fight Apocalypse to die. Yeah, and you're going to die, and it's not going to be easy. Yeah, it's not it, like he's going to just win and stick you. No, he makes you ask got, for it. It's, it's like, got to you know be what? to the death. Yeah, he beats the crap out of you and says, do you still want this? Yes. Okay. Drops the sword, beats you with his Apocalypse man mitts. <laughs> And still ask big blue hams. Yeah, I could get you out right now. You could be fully healed and everything, but you're just going to be human and mundane. What are you what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to earn the name that you no longer have being a human being? 
And of course, Melody being the badass that apparently she is, she goes all out for it. And then he just checks her out. Apocalypse through Melody, three stories off Hell in a Cell, right through yeah. announcement. <laughs> Back in 1998. <laughs> oh, I love that meme. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's going on here. Um, this book got really deep really quickly. And when I first heard about the Crucible, I thought, okay, that's stupid. Why would any X-Men sit by and watch Apocalypse beat, basically beat the shit out of somebody? But then when I saw the politics behind it, I was like, this really does make sense. Yeah, the spirituality of it really clicked. I love yeah. that last line of Nicole saying, I think I'm going to found a mutant religion. Yeah, I mean, well, there's politics and then, of course, the spirituality. And Nightcrawler is firmly uh, convinced that the soul is still playing a part in this, mm -hmm. but he's not sure how. I mean, does it sit by and wait? Does it wait for you in the afterlife? How, how are we doing this? So he's got all these deep questions all resounding around the fact that they're clearly immoral now. Yeah. There's another uh, interesting point where he even brings up is like, well, if we can like bring back people and reactivate their X gene, what's stopping us from, say, like splicing people like X gene, like boosting the X gene a bit, like giving someone Magneto's powers, which is a nice little foreshadow for the uh, I don't call it a foreshadow or a callback when it's referencing a, f a past future event. <laughs> yeah, he even <laughs> mentions the fact that it's in the will of somebody that when he comes back, he wants to be in a copy of Magneto's body. Yeah. It's like that's so, not happening. Chimera Chimera's getting set up. Yeah, won't be too long. Long. So apparently there are rules. I mean, you can come back, you come back as you. You don't come mm -hmm. back as somebody else's body, even though that is completely possible, apparently. Yeah, because I mean, it's just growing a body and then putting your brain yeah. into it. So I, I, I still I'm, I'm baffled. I really thought this was Apocalypse's idea. But when I found out it was Kurt's idea, I was like, OK, I've definitely got some. I, I got to wrap my brain around this one because Kurt is actually my all time favorite X-Men. He's a cool one. Yeah. If I wasn't going to take bring Sabretooth into it, which I know is cheating, <laughs> but it's Kurt. It's always been Kurt for me. And Fuzzy I, I, Blue Elf. Exactly. My, my cousin used to love Wolverine, but it's like, no, 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 no. It's all about the, the three <laughs> fingers, man. It's all about the three fingers. Uh, a couple of points I want to make sure we hit on this issue before uh, we move on to our final book of this week. Mm -hmm. uh, I really loved the scene where Nightcrawler almost discovers Moira. Yeah. He teleports into Moira's tower and he mentions how it looks like what he as a child would have envisioned like a perfect home to look. Yeah. He wanted to stay there. And he's like, doesn't that seem weird to you, Scott? And he's like, I don't know. Seems cool to me. Yeah. I was kind of baffled by that too. Cause I really didn't know what that was. I think it's supposed to be just like a kind of mental thing, maybe powered like by a Charles. Mental mate. Exactly. Like to kind of, to keep you from discovering what it is, basically. Yeah. Man, that's not going to last long. No, we're going to, that's going to crumble real quick. Yeah. And the other point I really wanted to, uh, to poke at is the continued exploration of the sex life of Scott Summers. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I've seen some speculation about that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's obviously very clear that there's it's a polyamorous a, relationship yeah. occurring. It, yeah. it ain't even subtext. It's yeah, text. There's no subtext at all because I mean, you got Wolverine who's up already and they're watching like, you know, the, the sky or something. And Scott walks in and says, Oh, you couldn't sleep either. And, and then Scott mentions the fact, well, I know why you can't sleep. It's all that body hair. You're either too cold or you're too hot. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, they they talk about having a vacation and Logan goes, huh, genie in a bikini. And Scott goes, Scotty, Scotty in a speedo. <laughs> uh, I, I'm so happy for my boy, Scott Summers, that he is the most well-adjusted he's ever been because all of his sexual frustration between Scott or between uh, Logan, Gene and Emma it's finally cured. Now we'll throw Matty Pryor in the mix and we'll see how this goes. Oh my God. It's going to be like a quintupro. <laughs> and uh, as a great transition to X-Men Fantastic Four number two, in what might be the single horniest panel of all of Don of X, <laughs> there's a bit where Scott's hanging out at the High Council and Emma goes, nice to like be at the big kids table, Scott. You thought about joining the High Council? And he goes, oh no, Miss Frost, you know me too well. I live to serve. While they're just making the most... Like there's most some intense sub FBI stuff I've going ever on. seen. Yeah. <laughs> the uh the summers polyamorous triangle with offshoot of Emma connected to Scott, yes. maybe connected to Gene question mark. I love it. Oh my god. All about this Krakoan love. We need to mess. throw mystique into this. <laughs> <laughs> we throw Kurt, you throw Kurt Angle to the mix, he won't even try. Yes. <laughs> so with that, X-Men Fantastic Four number two, another excellent, excellent issue. The Dodsons killing on art as they always do. Mm -hmm. uh, Chip Zdarsky 
You know, I keep telling myself, Chip Zdarsky, he's a big time Marvel writer now. Like, I'm not, I shouldn't be surprised when he keeps hitting these emotional gut punches like he did in Marvel 2 and 1. He does in Daredevil every month. But my God, like, he is come a long way from sex criminals and that's not a knock on sex criminals where he delivers some of the best side gags in comics which is wild to think that the guy who writes the best dramatic comic at marvel with daredevil is also the dude who uh crammed like 50 dick jokes into one panel well didn't sex criminals wrap up this week as well uh it's still going it's still going yeah, it's 27 has came out. four more issues okay but uh in x-men we've got the reveal that Doom has his own private mutant island. He moved all of the mutants in Latveria as a safety precaution. Of course. Moved them all onto a invisible island, which the Marauders happened to cross by, and that's why Doom attacked in the last issue. Oh, okay. He also claims that he has a solution to Franklin's problem. He's like, I believe in making people into the best of themselves and no one being held back. And also I can beat Richards. Hello, Apocalypse. (laughs) So Doom has plans for franklin richards we'll see how altruistic of course they Doom are has got plans for franklin richards i'm <laughs> surprised design. it always hasn't been like that they bring up that uh way way back in x-men fantastic four dr doom was instrumental in getting kitty unfazed when she was permanently phased after the mutant massacre yeah i remember that yeah and that they get a, go, a call back to that he kind of used it as like a you can trust me, Kitty. Don't you remember when i helped you all those years ago that's a second callback they've done to that yeah i mean it makes sense uh So back to that quiet council scene where the mutants are all like, hmm, the Richards are probably going to try and attack us because we kind of kidnapped their kid. Of course, they're not. uh, Scott, uh, Xavier and Eric are not taking credit for like, no, he left of his own volition. And Scott's like, we kind of kidnapped him. Kind of. They're kind of a crime. Like as a father myself. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So they're having this discussion when. They realize Hey, there's three invisible people around us, or there's four invisible people around us, and force fields go down. Mm. You see the entire Fantastic Four has snuck onto Krakoa using Sue's invisibility. Oh, my God. Big old fight between all the X-Men and the that's, FF. That's a big no-no. Oh, man. You don't it bring is. humans to Krakoa. And now they know that Franklin's not there, so they like, hmm, where the hell is Franklin? Where in the world is, is Franklin, Franklin Richards? Richards? Omega level mutant. <laughs> You know, the, uh, the, uh, since you bring up, well, the comic continues to bring up intangible uh, Kitty, who, um, if I'm not mistaken, that came from the Morlock Massacre. Yes. Yeah, Mutant Massacre. No, we got the Hellion, uh, the Hellion's book coming up with all the questionable folks in it, like Scalp Hunter, mm-hmm. who pretty much led the field team of the old Marauders to kill the Morlock Massacre. I wonder if there's a story to be told with all the now living Morlocks living with their assassins. I don't know. They're living out in Nevada country clubs. So <laughs> I don't think any of them are chilling on Krakoa. I, I, I got to know there's a story there, especially since now Scalpar is going to be in a book that's going to focus a lot yeah. on him. Are we going to see the other Marauders? But man, I want to see some payoff on the Morlocks that he killed, like Annabelle. Oh, we might just get that. Annalee. Annalee. Or I, Tommy. Like, I feel like that's such obvious low frank, hang fruit. They got to do it, you know? Yeah. Like, there's there's some good drama to be made there. That's what crossed my mind as I was walking to my car at, uh, from, from work uh, yesterday. I was like, I got to see that payoff. <laughs> I got to see that payoff. As much as I love the Marauders, I got to see the Morlocks going, hey, remember that time you blew my head off with that large rifle? That was pretty messed up. I didn't like that. I'm going to kill women and children living yeah. in the sewers. Didn't like that either. <laughs> So before we get to our news, there's a great last page reveal that a uh, doom shocker shocker might not be acting in everyone's best interests. No, because he's building doom tunnels. <laughs> They're doom sentinels. I couldn't think of a better name. Um, are you, I, I went with it. You got, I, I'm you okay got with the it. image. Yeah, they're, I got they're it. sentinels and they're green with little gray faces. They're all him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause I mean, cause that's not? doom. They're probably all to say doom too. Doom, 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 doom. doom. Hi, the science guy. <laughs> We've just named this episode. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, yes, X-Men Fantastic Four. It's real good. It's going to be, there's two more issues left. Mm-hmm. Pick it up. It's probably the strongest Doc spinoff. Although, I don't know, man. X-Men was amazing this week. Giant Size was amazing. Those X-Books are pretty dang good. I think the people over at DC should pay more attention to their competitors. I remember when a... Uh, right before all the doc stuff dropped, there was rumors that uh, old Johnny Hicks would would take a DC gig. 
I was really praying for Green Lantern and New Gods. I would totally be on board. I think Hickman, Green Lantern. Hickman seems like the only guy who could tackle New Gods. A lot of people were throwing out Legion as an idea. And I was like, I could see that. I I don't care about Legion, so it was the option I wanted the least of the bunch. I've almost completely forgotten about Legion of Superheroes. But, you know, I wouldn't trade any of those for what we're getting with X-Men because it's, it's too damn it's, good. It's gold. I mean, it, it's so much gold. I'm, I'm like, okay, how how tangible or not how tangible, but how um, temporary is this going to be? But then they just add another layer and another yeah. layer. And for me, the thing that cemented it is when Kurt was on board. Kurt did what he did and Kurt pretty much just shook his own values about religion says, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. This is right. <laughs> Here it is. And I was like, okay, now we've gotten so deep. It, 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 this has to be permanent somehow permanent. We forgot to mention, we we're talking about X-Men. Uh, <laughs> there's, cause there's so much there's, in these issues. These issues have so much stuff. There in them. is, uh, there's a, a heavy level of minutia, but there's a sequence where Exodus, remember Exodus, that oh, guy, yeah, yeah, yeah the, I, I keep the, forgetting the French guy from the 16th century has now got all his telekinetic powers. Yeah, I keep forgetting that he is on the Quiet Council, but and teaching children. Yeah, there's a scene here where he's teaching children about uh, How, what do they call her? The betrayer, the, the, the great betrayer, Scarlet the pretender, Witch, the pretender, Scarlet Witch. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm all in for a mutant religion that has Scarlet Witch as the devil figure. Yeah, and I love that they're and they, they can't they can't uh, bring her name up. Yeah, the kids <laughs> they treat her like Voldemort. Yes, but there's a an amazing scene where Exus asks is like and to the Great Pretender, "What do we say? No more." And yeah, like, what a great flip of no more mutants. I mean, I gotta say, I mean, they brought everybody on this island. I mean, everybody, assassins, murderers, genocidal maniacs, but not her. <laughs> Do you remember? uh, And not Quicksilver. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the opening of The Great Muppet Caper? Got that song. uh, Oh, my God. Got a movie starring everybody. Uh, Yeah. That's that's X-Men right now. Wow. You're digging up a memory. I haven't haven't even thought about that in years. Oh, my God. You brought up a childhood memory that just didn't want to die. And as uh, Casey (laughs) reels through the years, we'll uh, take a little break. A little bit of break. Then we're going to talk about some business. There, welcome to episode 25 of Hazardous Materials. Last week's comics, this week. This is Brooke with Haphazard Fiction Studios, and I want to give a big shout out to Gideon Gonzalez. Um, this week we are celebrating Gideon's 26th birthday, so definitely want to uh, implore everybody out there if you have it in you to give Gideon a little bit of love. Um, please don't hesitate. Um, we'd love to see some comments down below if you want to send us something on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, would love to hear from you guys and just, you know, let Gideon know that, uh, I don't know, hopefully you appreciate what he's doing. Gideon, your your information and knowledge for your age is absolutely incredible. Um, you and Casey are a pretty amazing team, so great job to both of you guys. We really appreciate everything you guys do for us. And hopefully all you listeners out there are enjoying the, uh, the show so far. But for now, I'll go ahead and take you back to the birthday boy with his hazardous material. <laughs> And we are back with uh, our first big news item of the day. Uh, it seems to be the past couple weeks for departing big wigs. Although this wig is much bigger than Dan DiDio's. Although we're going to talk about Dan. Yeah, we'll get to him. Uh, but Bob Iger, apparently in, a, in a, a one-day decision, has decided to step down as CEO of Disney. Uh, he's going to retain his role as the chairman of the board and also as the chief creative. Which, uh, it sounds to me like he just wants to do the fun stuff. And you can, I'll put all this nerd book stuff over to this new guy. <laughs> I got I done the same thing. <laughs> I got my docu series on Disney Plus. I'm cashing my chips. Yeah. So it's not like anything really dramatic happened. He just wanted to have fun, mm-hmm. and he found himself a new role. And more power to him. I no, just want to have fun. Not so much for poor Dan Dio though. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, so the details of his departure came out over the week. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he just got a. Call up to the execs, give him the boot, pack your shit and get out. And he got walked out the same moment. I mean, he he, he it's, it's like he got fired from a call center or something. It's just rough. <laughs> it is. So um, apparently a lot of people uh, attribute this to uh, mismanagement of certain assets and mismanagement of certain people. Uh, most uh, most certainly, of course, the mass exodus of DC editors in the past few months. Yeah, there's been a I think a. Uh, 
the biggest one that I really found shocking was when uh, Karen Berger got the boot and she was the one who was really instrumental in building up uh, Vertigo. Back yeah, in I was about to say. Late 80s, early 90s. I was really surprised to see her go. Me too. Because uh, that just seemed out of nowhere. Dark Horse did scoop her up, though, and they cur- and she curates a line of uh, Burger books over there. Those mm-hmm. are all pretty rad. Uh, they've since kind of killed Vertigo. They have, yeah. Took it out back and shot it. Which is a damn shame. And they just slapped the Sandman name on stuff. And now, and, and they took, of course, Hellblazer and they integrated him into the main DCU once again. Mm-hmm. And then he exited it just yes. as quickly as he entered it. <laughs> Scooted right out. Yeah. So um, that got a little bit of celebration from our local whipping boy, uh, Rob Liefeld. I don't want to dignify it with, with airtime. <laughs> that it's piece of garbage. Rob, Rob Liefeld whining on Twitter and... Getting in fights, it's it's a weekly event at this point. Yeah, I lo- I love how uh, he's getting involved in, in in stuff that's not even his. Although speaking of stuff that's not even his, I heard that Ethan Van Skyver was talking about uh, DC recently, like he knew what the hell was going on. <laughs> As if, yeah. I mean, not that we're gonna hold any uh, uh, rumors, but um, Ethan Van Skyver, our, our local genius artist and alt right scumbag. Uh, apparently went on Twitter talking about the fact that uh, he believed that AT&T was this close to selling DC off for spare parts. I don't believe it for a second. I don't either. It's it's not worth talking about. You know, it's it's just completely basis rumor. It's a way for him to get his name in the headlines. And yeah, can, can we it's cut this It's a good thing bit? that we're not headlines. <laughs> All right. So moving on, uh, w- uh, the new Candyman movie. This I am very excited for. Yes. Uh, it's being produced by Jordan Peele. and. Uh, much like the trailer for us involves a spooky remix of a 90s R&B classic. This time, Say My Name. Oh, God. Very good. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, Tony Todd actually had a contract uh, in the first can, uh, Candyman that he would get $1,000 every time he was stung by a bee. And he collected an extra 22000 on top of his paycheck. Smart man. Yep. That's a guy who's got a good yeah. agent. And he's coming back for this one, too. So he's not afraid of that stuff. Yeah. If we don't know in how big of a role yet, but uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen is going to be the lead. And he's actually a grown-up version of Baby Tony from the first movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, the woman who played his mother is also back. And it looks like from the trailer, one of the main like themes of the movie is going to be gentrification and how it's affected the uh, neighborhood from the original movie. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way because even the original one is playing with the idea of like nice buildings being reworked into projects. And so this is seeing the cycle continue. Full circle, yeah. Yeah, I am... I'm a huge, huge horror guy. Candyman's my top five favorite horror movies of all time. And really? Yes. Do not care much for the sequels, but I love that first one. That first one's gold. So we got Candyman. We got Hellraiser for you. Mm-hmm. I'm curious what the other three. Uh, Hellraiser, Reanimator, Evil Dead 2, the original Halloween, Candyman. Those are all pretty safe bets. And I can see you getting right behind that. So you don't care much for the, the newest Halloweens? I love the latest Halloween. Halloween 2018 is the only good Halloween sequel in my book. Yeah. Although there are th- things I can I enjoy in H2O. I think there's some good elements there. And uh, Halloween 2018 borrows a good amount from H2O. I love H2O. I, I, I wish that Resurrection could be erased from, God. from the world. <laughs> Remember when uh, Michael Myers... Muted, uh, like smashed a guy's throat and put a Michael Myers mask on him so he couldn't talk and shoved him out there. Because yeah, that's, 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 that's what the kind of guy Michael Myers is. I, I'm desperately afraid of my sister, so I'm going to set up this poor EMT with my mask. And he got his head cut and of off. Of course, trick or treat, bitch. <laughs> We need a buy. We need a we need a little bit of a byline for Halloween. A little uh, catchphrase for good old Mike to say. Mike doesn't speak. Let's give him something to say. Um, uh, and so we've also got something else on top of the trailer. You found the working title for the third Spider Man movie. Yes. Um, and also help me find out what the first two working titles were. So the new one is called Serenity Now. Which, as a big Seinfeld buff, gave me quite a chuckle. But then I found out that. Uh, Homecoming's working title was The Summer of George and Far From Home's working title was The Fall of George. So what we're basically hearing is that George Costanza is going to squeeze in here somewhere. I have been saying that Jason Alexander needs to play Uncle Ben since they cast Marissa Tomei as M.A. (laughs) I just need Peter to rush up 
to his his uncle dying in a puddle of blood in New York Street, leans in close as he whispers, it was supposed to be the summer of Ben. <laughs> Poor, poor Ben. I'm glad that we stopped killing Ben on the big screen. I really think that he needed a break. Got to give him, got to give my boy Jason Alexander a check. Bring him <laughs> back, Marvel. Give me Uncle Ben dying one more time. So, from what I understand, um, uh, oh, oh you know, I, I, I got as many times as I hear rumors about this stuff, and I wish it would to be true. I'm trying not to bring too many rumors into this show, um. But I am hearing more and more about how Sony really wants to stay in bed with Marvel even after their current deal, which basically is one Spider-Man movie and then one movie mm-hmm. where Spider-Man guest stars, which is we pretty much already figured out is Doctor Strange in the, in the multiverse yeah. of madness. They want to get that sweet, sweet trickle down effect onto Morbius and Venom, too. Yeah, which is the reason why, hey, we got to have Vulture showcasing in this Morbius trailer to show <laughs> and the- MCU. <gasps> oh, man. Another bit of news that I don't think we remembered to write down, but it's my favorite bit of news this week. What's that? Uh, my boy Woody Harrelson. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> There's Check gonna this be picture out. <laughs> uh, Ramon Villalobos put it best when he said that he looks like an offspring fan and went into a bunker to avoid Y two K and came out frozen twenty years later. <laughs> Maybe that's how long poor Cletus has had. Of course, uh, Cletus went from one bad, horrible hairdo like, into yeah, another. How did they get worse than the Ronald McDonald wig? I don't know, man. We got that first wig was really a horror show. <laughs> oh my god! It's it's my thought that this this, this 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 shirt, this thing he's wearing, is probably a heavy hint as to what the the color pattern that that Carnage will probably have. Oh yeah. Uh, his goofy, God, his goofy skull medallion. There's just, oh, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> off, 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 spring fan. I, uh, I did see Donny Cates post that he found that same shirt like at a thrift store. Oh, that's so the best. That's pretty great. And uh, actually, this weekend uh, for my birthday, I'm doing a double feature of Parasite and Venom. <laughs> Where are you doing this at? At my home. It's a double feature at the at the Gideon residence. Indeed. The the two best movies of the last two years about Parasites. Also see Parasite if you, had, if you haven't seen it. Totally, Absolutely see Parasite. Totally deserve that best that best movie win. Oh, God. Um, so next up we got uh, CW finally got a new cast for The Lost Boys, and apparently now they're showcasing it. We so found the boys. We have definitely found the boys, and now we're just hoping for that, that sweet, sweet supernatural standing where we can keep something going on for 10, 12 seasons. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean... It, it doesn't take much to stay in the CW. All you really need to do is be even slightly interesting and have even a quarter, maybe an eighth of the numbers from NBC. And, hey, and then you're on forever. You know, they've got a they got that DC connection. So though you can totally be looking for a very serious book in the first episode. Oh, I don't know. No, Lost Boys has no. Uh, well, the CW has the DC. Yeah, OK, shows. I see what you're saying. I see what I'm you're saying for a Batman. It's a serious book. It's a serious book. <laughs> well, you, you can't put the 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 Superman's where he has hasn't even figured out c- gold kryptonite with these books. And I'm like, stop it, Corey. You're embarrassing us. You're embarrassing yourself. Corey's an icon. Sir. You're embarrassing everybody. R.I.P. Corey. Um. <laughs> so I'm really excited about this. I love me some Lost Boys. Lost Boys is easily in my personal top five of vampire films. I will if if Lost Boys happens to be on television and I'm actually doing something I need to be focusing on, I will stop and watch that Lost Boys. He's got mesmerizing saxophone solo, yeah, man. At least. <laughs> man, that guy's great. He does the sax really well. And you know it's a lot of body oil. <laughs> speaking of bats, uh Kevin Smith gave an update for the first time in what a decade since Widening Gyre came out! Oh yeah, you're just going to get used to the fact that when Kevin Smith talks about comics, it's going to take a decade. I really like uh, he does preface by saying it's hap- like it's happening. I'm getting around to it. Yeah, he uh, he says apparently he's got three full like three full issues of art from Walt Flanagan in the mm-hmm. can. They're just waiting on him to God write out those last Walt three. Walt Flanagan's dog is faster than anything. <laughs> 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 oh my god, we've we actually got the uh the Jay and Silent Bob action figures from Graffiti Studios and at the store. Oh yeah. It comes with the uh Walt Flanagan's dog accessory. Oh my god, Walt Flanagan's dog is so fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the uh the penis that is bigger than the dog itself. Yeah, and funny Iconic. thing is you can, if you if you're actually curious about good old Walt Flanagan, you can actually see him on comic book men. Well, not anymore. The show no, well, he used to be, but he was the goon that didn't have any uh, facial hair. <laughs> 
<laughs> good identifying feature. Yep. But yeah, he uh, he drew Kevin Smith's two prior Batman comics, uh, Cacophony and Wyden and Geyer. Mm-hmm. Wyden and Geyer famously ended on a big old cliffhanger of uh, Silver St. Cloud getting murdered by good old Onomatopoeia. I see, this is back when, uh, well, this this harkens back to the fact that I don't read Batman at all, uh, so you're going to have to tell me all about Cacophony, this. So, Cacophony is a great three-issue miniseries with uh, Maxi Zeus hiring Onomatopoeia, who is a killer of uh, non-powered vigilantes. I remember Onomatopoeia from Kevin Smith's Green Arrow. Yes, and he moved over there. I think he showed up in Green Arrow <laughs> first, then moved over to Cacophony. One of the two. Uh, Widening Geyer had a lot. So, the biggest thing people talked about in Widening Geyer was uh oh lord we're going in okay hit us two things in widening gyre the first thing that everyone really focused on was a scene where batman's got a new sidekick he's taking on his wing and he's like it's okay to be nervous a lot of weird things happen some variables i remember that scene in batman year one where i say you've eaten well and i do the explosion well there was a muscle spasm and and you peed your pants so uh, I love your Batman voice. Thank you. So Kevin Smith made it canon that uh, in, well, actually, who knows about the can- canosity of widening gyre oh, or anything. But uh, yeah, Batman, Batman pissed himself in year one, according to widening gyre. I believe it. Then uh, if also- Superman can be a Navy SEAL. Batman can pee himself. <laughs> yeah. And there's also a sequence. Oh, yeah, because this will definitely be a black label whenever this comes out. Mm-hmm. But uh where Alfred comes to check on on Bruce Wayne and Silver St. Cloud, who is a pretty, pretty great Bruce Wayne love interest from the 70s Steve Engle art detective comics. Great one. But uh, Kevin Smith made the choice of uh, having her nickname for Bruce be Double O because, or is it D? No, it's DD because they hit double digits the first time they slept together in terms of orgasms. So if you want to, true kevin smith bit in your batman comic and to let you know that bruce wayne has great sexual prowess there you have it well we all saw his unit about a year ago i mean yeah, he had exactly. to be doing something with that thing <laughs> man was um, packing bad wings i'm telling you kevin man. smith was ahead of the curve oh god <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so delete that one <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a uh a considerable cliffhanger because Automatopia like slices Silver Saint Cloud's throat, and that's the last panel of Widening Gyre. I remember that frame. Yes, I do remember that frame yep. because I Automatopia does kind of catch my attention because I've always liked the design of his mask. Yeah, it's a great looking character, mm-hmm. and he's a character that can only work in the field of comics. Yes, Arrow, that was not a good episode. <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> and so so I'm I'm curious to see how this all wraps up. Will we ever see the end of it, or will it wind up being like Daredevil the Target? Was it uh, was it Daredevil Target? I thought it was like Daredevil Red or Blue or uh, something like that. No, Daredevil the Target. That was uh, the very post-9-11 Daredevil comic that got one issue, and then Kevin Smith got busy with other stuff. And he just bailed on it. Yeah. Classic well, Kev. Well, Love that guy, a, but he can't commit to a book. No, he can't, but apparently uh, he's committing to uh, Clerks 3 now. Fingers uh, crossed. I'm really happy they got uh, Jeff on that one. I think we talked about that one, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still excited about that. I'm still and, excited. And uh, one last little bit of news. It's more of just a fun thing that we lo- think is pretty neato. Yeah. Uh, your boy Todd McFarlane, Drew, Spidey, and Spawn hanging together. out together. <laughs> like the first time in like, well, I think ever. Yeah. yeah ever. I, I remember a couple, uh, I think it was last year, he drew a headshot of Spidey going, Spawn is my favorite superhero. And I rolled my eyes into space. And this was like a year. <laughs> and they, they're still there orbiting. And this was like a year after he uh, he crashed the DC Metal panel to ask uh, <laughs> to ask Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, hey, why is Spawn cooler than Batman? <laughs> Iconic. Why, why does why does your Todd McFarlane sound like some some bohunk from Canada near the mis- near Michigan? I mean, oh yeah, I really like them. I was like those hills. Let's squirt skiing at them. Yeah, How hey, about that? How hey, about watch, that spawn? Watch yourself, pal. <laughs> I, I I have a complicated relationship with Todd. Love him. Think he's a bit of a shrewd businessman, a little shrewder than I would choose to be. But you know, can't argue with success. Man's got $2 million balls. Do you remember that uh, Batman Spawn and Spawn Batman? Yeah, they're uh, they're not good. They're, they're awful. I was, yeah, 
the I think it's a spawn Batman. Well, no, I think Batman Spawn was the one with uh, Frank the Tank writing with uh, with Todd on art duties. Mm -hmm. That ends with uh, Spawn taking a batarang to the face, splitting his face in half. He spends the entire book being roasted by Batman. Yeah. Everything about you sucks. (laughs) You suck. You really suck. Imagine being Todd, inviting your hero to draw to write your book and being like, oh, geez. Yeah, well, I mean, he's, he he loved that so much because, you know, usually something like this, it rolls around. They don't put it in continuity. DC mm-hmm. usually ignores crossover continuity. But Spawn was rocking that face wound for years. Yeah, he had, a, he had to get a shoelace to, to tie, tie it up. It. Yeah, that was, that was good <laughs> stuff. Oh, God. Yeah. He he really wanted that to be part of his continuity. Yeah, and DC's a, like, whatever. And then Spawn Batman, I think his war drums is what it was mm-hmm. called. Not memorable. It was garbage, too. Like. I, it wasn't I, half as cool the, as, as uh, the, the, the spawn roast of yeah, 1993. I, I don't think I don't think Todd wrote or drew war drums either. No, it was all DC. Yeah. No, it was it was a forgettable 90s Batman one shot. Yeah, it really was. It's garbage. Yeah. Ain't great. But that Batman spawn, that's got some entertainment value. Yeah. In it. If you if you want to see spawn get completely <laughs> roasted by his own creator. If you want to see, if you want to see or, the, or Frank Miller roast him. If you want to see the start of Frank Miller writing Batman is just completely nuts. That's that's where it starts. Like once he once he had a few issues of Marv under his belt, there's no more going back to year one Batman. Oh God, Marv! I still to this day really want the the Marv action figure of him in the electric chair. That's pretty rad. I first saw that at your store I, way back in the day, and I was like, "This is the coolest thing." Ever. I kind of want to get the creepy Elijah Wood figure who comes with his own severed head. Of course, it does. Although. Yeah. Honestly, the best Sin City action figure mm-hmm. is that yellow bastard. Mm, yeah, they squeezed him in. Was he in the sequel? Like or was he lemon. in the first one? He was in the first one. He was in the first one. And they, they made him look as completely unnerving as he should. Oh Big old God. Dick Tracy ass head. Who played him? I have no idea. Wasn't it the guy that was in Terminator 3? Mm, not sure. Who played John Connor in Terminator 3? I'm pretty sure it was. Man, well, he looked real creepy. And he was real creepy because they shaved his head and turned him yellow. Yeah, and they added like onto his head, so he had a more yeah, this, circular this, head. This pear-shaped reverse yeah. head. Big, big friend. I'm energy. pretty sure it was a. Uh, I don't know, Nick Stahl. Is that his name? Uh-huh. Who knows? It was. It was hideous. We've gotten off the mark, but yeah, uh, but you know we we've had a lot of time to kill on this episode, so I, I think we were okay with that. We had a lot of fun today, but no, it's not fun. Not supporting your local podcast. That's true. That's not fun. Don't don't read this and forget about us. Support us. Make us want to do this more. We know we're going to do it anyway. Give us your likes. Give us your follows. Hit that bell. Because we'll be here letting you know. Every Tuesday, we're going to show up on the day right before your new comics hit and go to remind you, hey, Red stuff from last week you didn't pick up? Go get that. Follow us on all of our socials down below, including the Twitter. The, the Twitter. Insta. The Patreon. You can see all of the fun pictures that we have utilized today. That I'm, I, I swear to God, I'm going to download or upload. Sorry. Um, uh, check out my Facebook page, uh, My Comic Book Facts, where I uh, I like to write about stuff that you may, as a casual reader, not know anything about. I will definitely tell you about it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's going to do it for this week. That is definitely us. We'll see you next week. Bye.